COVID illustrated some of the fallacy in the idea of globalizing your supply chain. Because when you had containers, when you're bringing over ingredients or goods from Asia, the Middle East, go from $1,500 per container to $15,000 per container. Like, what does that do to your gross margins, right? That's just one use case during COVID. It's about having, you know, the right team that really understands these markets you know, yeah. intuitively like the back of their hand. And we have that in what we call our disruptive ag segment. So it starts with the people. I think everybody, regardless of where they're looking, gets some piece of unique data that then can be actionable. Yeah, we call it sensing. Like in a sense, like you are, each individual yeah. is a sensor. Mm -hmm. and keeping your kind of antenna up for those kind of shifts in people's behavior and expectations. You know, I speak consumer and I've been, as I said, in the consumer world for 20 years. We're very attuned to that, to be able to provide additional benefits back to the business and ultimately back to our shareholders in terms of really having our finger on the pulse of where this is going. We don't see better for you foods, the growth slowing down anytime soon. Okay, everyone, and welcome back to the channel. We have another interview today. We actually have the founder and vice president of Above Food here. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation. The other chats we had were more, I'd say, direct retail focused, where this is a little bit more all-encompassing, where you have production and you have distribution, you have um, retail, you have all of that wrapped up. So I'm sure we're going to have some really cool conversations about the state of the economy and what we're seeing and and how the unique vantage point that's given to us uh, by Martin here is going to show us a little bit of a world that I personally haven't really learned too much about so far. So without further ado, Martin, how's it going? Good to see you, Michael. How are you? Good to see you. I hear you're in, uh, you're, we, well, we were just talking off screen, you're in a hotel in New York, and I actually, I've, I've had your website open here, and I've been uh, re reading this for some time, and it definitely doesn't give the website in New York vibe. There's a lot of, you know, beautiful fields, and I see some uh, Canadian real estate there, which is amazing as a Canadian myself. Uh, I, I love to see that. So what are you doing in New York? Why don't you tell the people we'll start with that? Well, yeah, we're bringing our entire team to New York for a pretty exciting event. Um, we were invited by the NASDAQ to ring the bell tomorrow uh, morning, Friday the 12th. So we'll be live at Market Open with about 75 people from our team. So wow. we've descended on New York. So the Canadians, uh, the Canadians are running rampant in Times Square. That's good. I love um... <laughs> It's funny, I, I can hear a little bit of the accent myself, but they'll definitely point it out down there. I've noticed in New York every time you're, oh, you must be Canadian. And thankfully, that's usually, uh, usually greet with a smile anyway. It's, you know, people are usually happy. They're like, oh, this guy's probably not going to beat me up for, for no reason because he's, cause he's <laughs> Canadian. So uh, let's get going on on your company. So I know, you know, I was looking at it. You've uh, de spacked recently and you're listed under the ticker essentially above ABVE. Just to give the people a high level overview, what it is you guys do, what it what is your purpose and, and what are you trying to achieve? Well, Michael, it's a, it's a really interesting time uh, in the world, and it's certainly uh, a time that a story like ours, time has come. Um, we call ourselves a regenerative ingredient company, and I'll unpack what we mean by that. But Above Food is really the only business of scale in food ingredient and food product production focused exclusively on regeneratively produced foods. Now, what does that mean? That means, you know, taking care of the earth, taking care of the soil, taking care of the primary farm producer as key stakeholders in your value chain. Now, we saw that the world was moving to a place where you needed to have more control of your value chain. I mean, obviously, some of the issues you had with some of the big retail names during COVID illustrated that globalization, while can be beneficial economically, operationally adds a great degree of complexity and supply chains have been an absolute disaster since we what we brought together and had the foresight to do was really knit together what we call a seed to fork platform and as the name suggests our company includes everything from non-gmo seed genetics on one end all the way to consumer product manufacturing on the other end and it's quite a unique approach because you typically find businesses that are in one part of the value chain. You're a commodity merchandiser, you're a genetics company, you're an ingredient manufacturer, 
you're a consumer product manufacturer or a brand and you stay in your lane. And, you know, what we saw was that we needed to gain greater control of our value chain. And so knit this together as really the world's first scaled business doing what we're doing. That's really interesting because generally when you hear that kind of supply chain control and, and lockdown, the first company that just sticks to my mind is Apple, right? That's their their primary use case is that they're, uh, you know, you buy, I'm sitting here, I'm just looking around, I've got a, an iPad and a Mac and a phone, and it's like all these work together and it all makes sense, but they get to control uh, every aspect throughout. So was it COVID as the primary factor to say, hey, you know, we need to control all aspects of this because I, I, I've seen a lot of companies start to talk about that now when they weren't before, or is this something that you guys were pushing towards um, before COVID made that, you know, a, a big realization that we have to kind of focus on uh, each end of, of a supply chain? COVID certainly exacerbated it, but we had this thinking back in 2017. So it was a well before COVID where we saw that our customers wanted more supply certainty. Mm -hmm. Our customers wanted to buy their ingredients when we're talking our B2B side of the business further out in advance. And really the only way you can satisfy those two things, if you have physical assets on the, on what we call the primary production side. So think, you know, we buy grains from large scale farm producers. So we don't own the farmland, but mm -hmm. you can think about us as like the first derivative of arguably some of the best, most fertile firm land in the world, and that is the Northern Plains, the United States, and the Western Prairie Provinces of Canada. So how do you, how do you ensure supply certainty? Well, you got to own your assets. How do you ins ensure that, you know, food insecurity is dealt with? Well, you need scale. How do you build a business that has more foresight into gross margins? Well, you need to build more value add. And so that's the thinking we had in 2017. And certainly the macro is working, you know, on the consumer side in favor of this thesis, because you've got the growth of better for you foods, which, you know, I've been working in food for 25 years. I've never seen the degree to which people care where their food comes from, like I do now, right? Even my mother, who, who isn't necessarily all that concerned about where food is produced, she'll pick up the package now and look at the back. And I think that behavior is endemic of, of a lot of our behaviors. We want to know where food comes from. And unless you own your value chain, Unless you own more of that supply chain, you simply just don't and you can't provide that as a benefit. Now, that can show up as traceability, right? People want to know precisely where their food was grown. Yep. It can also show up as food safety, where you know what goes into your food and how it was grown and how it was produced. And, you know, these are all benefits that we can provide now, having kind of built this with the foresight back in, in 17. So, so with that trend, and I, I've noticed the same thing, and and uh, you know, it's a bit of a, a health nut sometimes. Sometimes myself, uh, I noticed doing the same. But is that a is that a trend that you think will persist over time? People getting more and more interested with exactly what's in their food and where and where their food's coming from. And uh, you know, a second question is how much of a luxury do you think that is? So, uh, what I'm trying to kind of get here is that as you know, you know, inflation is rampant and, and some people are feeling a little bit more of an economic burden. Is that one of the first things to go or one of the last things to go where it's, you know, I'm trying to compare prices, the price of everything's very high right now. Uh, do you think that that's something that people are really going to focus on? You know, if the economy kind of continues in this direction where things get a little bit harder, are they going to um, be so much choosy about where food comes from? And is there any kind of economic benefits, I guess, from owning that supply chain that would that would help alleviate this? Our perspective is that you know, food is not a luxury, right? You may not need that new handbag. You may not need the upgrade of the car, but you're damn sure you're going to need a farmer three times a day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from our perspective, we focused on scale for two reasons. One is we always wanted to have a scale business to satisfy as much you know, demand as we possibly could. But secondarily, scale allows us to bring these premium attributes to market but be comparative with kind of you know kind of middle of the market price points it's important to us that this isn't a upper middle class wealthy proposition at retail it's important to us that anyone can afford this right so that's the underlying kind of thesis our belief is that you know 
food is one of the last things to be impacted in terms of you're still going to eat, you're still going to buy, you know, groceries. What we see though, and, and I think we built part of our strategy reflective of this is that you will see a trade down. Consumers may trade down from a national brand to a private label brand. And part of our platform is manufacturing for the largest private labels in the nation. So you might not get, pick up that box that's branded, but the store brand at a perhaps more value oriented price point with the same attributes. Well, that feels like a win. Right. And so the growth of private label, I think, is, is actually quite reflective. And PLMA came out with some statistics yesterday illustrating both the, the, the dollar share growth and the unit share growth of private label relative to all other food and beverage. And it's growing twice as fast. So we're seeing that trade down. And private label manufacturers have really kind of understood that that drives differentiation for them into their stores. Why is my customer going to drive by a competitor and come to my shop? Certainly prices, but but assortment. Do yep. you have distinct differentiated products that excite me at a price point that I can afford to put in the grocery cart every shop? Right. That's how we think about it. And that's how, you know, we, we kind of drive our strategy is, it, you know, this is the, the best for the most for the least. No, that's great. And I love that. Now, um, you know, talking about the uh, the health benefit of of doing this kind of, uh, you know, seed to seed to customer it's kind of supply chain makes me kind of want to probe you about supply chains in general uh, a little mm. bit for, for our users who are, are kind of long term investors, because this was the thing you couldn't turn on any podcast or or radio station or anything without hearing about, you know, all the shipping containers backed up in the LA ports and how, you know, all of this inflation, a lot of this inflation was very much supply chain driven. And then the fact with COVID and all that, um, are you guys, A, since you've been kind of looking at this before COVID, did you feel that pain and notice that? And are you seeing that fully dissipate now? Or are there still some supply constraints that you're worried about? Or do you think, you know, at least kind of knock on wood for now, from a supply chain point of view, we have more of an all clear and, and things should be flowing as normal? I think you know, I'm going to take one step up and I will answer your question. But I think that, you know, I think COVID illustrated some of the fallacy in the idea of, of globalizing your supply chain. Yeah. Because when you had containers, when you're bringing over ingredients or goods from, you know, Asia, the Middle East, go from fifteen hundred dollars per container to fifteen thousand yeah. per container like what does that do to your gross margins right that's just one use case during COVID. but i think people have now felt the pinch i mean i had i we had customers that said basically everyone right now is supply chain manager irrespective yeah. if your sales or operations or finance everyone became a supply chain manager um which which i think illustrated you know an acute pain point but certainly this was starting to be felt well in advance. And we saw this in terms of the purchasing behavior of our largest customers. They, you know, recognized that perhaps that was a fallacy and they wanted to have surety of supply and the way that they hedged against that was they would contract, you know, us for ingredient production in some instances, nine months in advance to ensure that their bakeries or their pasta mills or their biscuit manufacturing facilities always had the inputs that they did because that downtime obviously has an economic impact on their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So we saw it in the behavior and the purchasing behavior. And what we've seen since is more of our customers wanting to have greater certainty in their supply and therefore willing to purchase well and ahead. And so for, for us, right, as a, as a company, we have, you know, in any given fiscal year, within the first 60 days, we have upwards of 70% of our revenues committed and under contract. So, you know, that from a, from a just purely resource allocation standpoint, that gives us great confidence in where we're allocating our resources and how we're allocating our resources to drive our strategy, because it's really leaning into the behavior that our customers kind of want to hedge against. So the, uh, and now, so we're going to talk to the pure trading nerds right here as, as someone who's uh, very interested in kind of the commodity side of, of trading. So, you know, you're saying that you have all of these pre-orders and they're ready to go. And then you also have contracts and deals with uh, with farmers. So how do you deal with the 
the uncertainty between that. If you have someone who gives you a big order and said, you know, hey, you know, I want you to supply X amount of of this grain. Is there any financial hedging you guys do in those markets to make sure that, you know, you're locking in prices at a favorable rate? I'm thinking a lot of, you know, what we saw with wheat uh, during the Russia Ukraine invasion and then also cocoa recently. I know right, we're not growing cocoa uh, up where you guys are, but just the, the fact that a lot of these prices can be very, very stable for long periods of time. And then some event can occur, whether it's weather related or or whatever it is, a, a plague or something in the, in the crops can cause these just dramatic price shifts. Um, how do you deal with that from a day to day point of view? If you're, if you're doing a lot of your selling up front um, to make sure that your, your price is contained. Great question. I mean, this is where we've got a team that's dedicated to pricing, right? We've, we're, we're not a, a grain trader in the commodity sense. You know, mm -hmm. what we do is more merchandising model where we're always adding some value and not just playing, you know, the, the kind of arbitrage grain game. So first of all, it's about having, you know, the right team that really understands these markets, you know, yeah. intuitively, like the back of their hand. And we have that um, in our, in what we call our disruptive ag segment. And so it starts with the people. The second one is, very few of the ingredients and grains that we're um, distributing are on CBOT, right? They're not commodities that you can hedge against per se. I mean, there are there are a couple. So we're really talking about kind of playing in the feed of the large commodity players and, and in kind of value add segments where that's not really of interest to them, but it's of great interest to us because of the growth and because of, of the, the increasing demand of those segments. And I'll give you a, a for instance, right? Chickpeas. You're not necessarily going to see, you know, an ADM in the in the chickpea market, but it's really interesting to us because of the growth of things like the hummus category, or the growth of things like uh, chickpea concentrate to drive higher protein levels in snack bars or in smoothies or in things like that. Right, that's a great example of, uh, you know, something that's not on CBOT per se, and that we have a real advantage position because of the of the of the grain merchandisers that we have on our team. So we're not hedging against this. Um, we're, we're certainly being smart. We don't take a lot of long positions and speculate. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to match a, a buy and a sell contemporaneously, right? As much as we can. Now, the forward contracting obviously adds a variable there where there's a, there is a degree of risk, but we protect our margins because we're not purely in the commodity space and price that kind of closer to delivery. So we may have a purchase order for a certain volume from a customer, but we don't price it until we're close to delivery because we need to work with our farm producers to ensure that they're getting kind of a fair deal as well. And we, we call it, what we say is we enshrine our margins to ensure that we're not susceptible to the wide swings in commodity prices, like you point out yeah. with wheat a few years back, right? That's how we, that's how we operate. And that's how we can be, have kind of more predictable kind of margins because it's protected. Yeah, and that's great because yeah, the commodity market can get can get crazy sometimes. So I'm glad that's been uh, certainly uh, kind of thought through. Um, but you mentioned something there that that triggered a question in my mind where, you know, th that initial question was about you know short term fluctuations. You have an order and then cocoa you know rockets for a couple months and then you know probably back back down whatever uh, over the long run. But you talked there about kind of changes and trends. Now, as someone who you know, I'm also from Canada, but I'm from the fishing part of Canada, not the growing part of Canada. So um, when you notice changes in trends, like you mentioned chickpeas becoming more popular for protein supplements and things like that, how long does it take to gather that data and then give that information to your partners kind of in the in the farm and say, hey, this is something that we think is a trend and that that trend is going to continue. So you should grow more of X versus Y. Do you uh, communicate that back and forth at all? Are you able to kind of put your finger on the pulse of what you think is the next commodity that's going to be blended into XYZ that, you know, some famous influencer is going to talk about and we're all going to want to eat? So it's exciting that you've kind of highlighted this because it is a real point of differentiation for us, right? Some people think about a supply chain as linear. Mm -hmm. We think about our seed to fork platform as cyclical in that because we can go from seed genetics, what's the seed you're putting in the ground and what are the attributes that, that seed can ultimately create downstream, you know, in terms of what you put on package, right? It does start yeah. with the seed. We can have conversations with the agronomists 
and the geneticists that are driving these programs almost immediately. And I'll give you a, for instance, that chickpea coming back to that um, protein snacking, right. In terms of driving better for you is still growing kind of leaps and bounds faster than most other segments in snacking. Okay, well yeah. now, and this is, this is, this is, again, this is, let's think about this as, as the art of the possible. Chickpeas naturally have kind of lower protein than a lot of other beans. Um, but what if you could have a chickpea that has higher protein content? Well, now you can work with the hummus manufacturers to say, would you be interested in having a higher protein chickpea? Because then on your package, you can talk about this is a, 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 pro, a high protein snack, right? Again, art of the possible, but that happens almost instantaneously. We see a trend in terms of consumer protein snacking, um, you know, it increase in pulses and protein snacking. We can have that conversation with our geneticists to say, hey, guys, this is what we're seeing. Um, we should start work on a higher protein chickpea, just as an example, right? Because we think that customers are going to want to be there in 12 months, 18 months, pick a time frame, and we need to be ready so that we are first mover in, in that market. That's one of a dozen different crop types where mm -hmm. we're having that conversation. A real tangible one and something we can point to historically was the growth of quinoa. Right. The growth on of quinoa on menus across America, and this is a staggering statistic. Quinoa has grown 1700 percent. Now, obviously, it's off of a small base yeah. on menus. So you think about everything has a scoop of quinoa in it. Now, there's a quinoa bowl. It's got quinoa in your salad. You've got quinoa puffs and quinoa crisps and snack bars. Right. Quinoa, simply put, is a superfood. And we've got a large portfolio of quinoa ingredients. Um, you know, this is something that we've been building over the last few years. We acquired a business that really gives us four proprietary genetics in quinoa to drive things like pro higher protein, to drive things like lower bitter tastes, right? Um, to really kind of help food service customers as well as CPGs with, you know, quinoa as an ingredient. And the other thing that we've done is we've really stabilized the supply chain for quinoa. You don't think about quinoa as, you know, unstable, but... You know, it is very much kind of a, a, a smaller industry that's aggregated out of South America. Growing it in North America at the scale we're growing, it flattens the supply chain. Now you can start to have conversations with global multinational food companies about having this replace some of their other ingredients because we grow it domestically. So there's just one example about how that works cyclically. And we're always having that conversation with different parts of our business. I'd say the other part of that question, this is a long winded answer, but it's fine. we can also, the differentiation is we understand consumer because we speak that language. We're in those markets. So when we're talking to our B2B customers about where the puck is going, I mean, that's obviously a very Canadian euphemism. <laughs> we know because we see it from the consumer end and from the retail end. So we're not just an order taker from our B2B kind of customers. We are a partner because we can help them understand, you know, where that puck is going and where they ought to be and, and how they should be purchasing these ingredients from, you know, not just us, but from, you know, their cadre of, of vendors. And I love that answer because, you know, like we mentioned, or I mentioned before we got started here is that our audience is mainly investors and, and shorter term traders. And I love how, you mentioned that from both ends, you guys are able to, you know, look at and influence things. Now, at, from the investor side of things, we can't influence anything. We're just trying to look to see where, where trends arise. But, uh, you know, we get questions all the time of someone who's in what they think is an unrelated industry to finance. And how do I know what to invest in? And how do I know what to, um, you know, where to put my money and where to put my time and focus? And, you know, as, as you were saying, I think everybody, regardless of where they're looking, gets some piece of unique data that then can be actionable, right? So you guys are seeing from here's what the farmers are making and here's what, you know, people are buying and and we can try to view those trends as they go. But just, you know, to our audience talking about, you know, you should do the same thing regardless of where you are in life. You should, you should take that example of if you can see any of these trends, like you mentioned the, the quinoa explosion, even if, you know, that's not somewhere that you work, if you're noticing these things pop up more and more, you should take a look at companies that are going to then produce that or, or, or market that and have some sort of benefit off it. So that, again, that was just a little aside for our audience that I think will, uh, there's a great takeaway there. So, um, yeah, we call it sensing, like in a sense, like you are each individual yeah. is a sensor. Mm -hmm. And keeping your kind of antenna up for those kind of shifts in people's behavior and expectations 
you know, I speak consumer and I've been, as I said, in the consumer world for 20 years, we're very attuned to that, to be able to provide additional benefits back to the business and ultimately back to our shareholders in terms of really having our finger on the pulse of where this is going. We don't see better for you foods, the growth slowing down anytime soon to your earlier question. People now understand that this makes them feel better. They feel better about it. And therefore, they're willing to spend, if in some instances, if it's a premium, because of the way it makes them feel, either physically or, you know, mentally, emotionally. Yeah. And, right, you know, there's, you can invest until the cow comes home and, and build up as much money as you want. But you're right, unless you're treating your body well and, you know, eating good foods and, and you're around and able to enjoy it, right, kind of kind of what's the point from there. So, um, you know, I did want to leave you with, or before we get going, just uh, a couple questions about how you're seeing just global trends. And I'm trying to ask this to all of the um, founders and presidents and CEOs that we have on, uh, just to see if you've got any kind of unique knowledge on gl like global economic kind of trends. You know, are you seeing any softness in the customer? Are you seeing any um, you know, worry about jobs or anything like that, or when, from your view of the economy and, you know, cause again, you're seeing it from a lot more aspects than a lot of people out there are, you know, how, how are the vibes, I guess, out there? Are people happy or? I think there's still a great degree of trepidation in terms of like there, I mean, obviously in America, there's an election coming up and you can't you know, ignore that. Mm -hmm. Um, global conflict weighs on people's minds. However, I think that what we're starting to see is a degree of optimism around, you know, just self-fulfillment. There's an aging population you can't deny, but this is the smartest kind of most educated um, with the greatest access to interventions, be they medical, through food, exercise to drive better health outcomes. I think we look at our company as really at the nexus of that. Like we are producing only better for you foods that drive, you know, ultimately customers to have better decisions to make. You know, what we see, you know, is, you know, this idea of personalized medicine, right? As, an, as the population ages, you take more agency over your health. Mm -hmm. You start to feel the aches and the pains when you get out of bed. You start to kind of fumble yeah. for words. Maybe your vision isn't as great anymore. That aging population is a reality. But they've got access to tools. They've got access to products. They've got access to services like never before. And I think a big part of that, and we're starting to understand from an epigenetic standpoint, how food impacts your overall health. And so what we see is, yes, there's a lot of stuff you can't control. There's a lot of stuff that weighs on your mind, but the stuff you can control, right? What you put in your mouth and what you put in your body. And now we know the type of profound impact that has. You know, we like we like the growth of better for your foods and we like the fact that, that this is growing, you know, faster than all other food and beverage, reflective of people wanting to put better things in their body because it makes them feel better. So I like that. I like where we're positioned. I like the yeah. fact, I mean, we've called our company above, right? It's very deliberately, we're above food. You know, we're above the status quo. We're above, um, you know, making kind of common products. We look at ourselves as very uncommon. We look at ourselves as a leader first mover in this market to be able to bring to the world this idea that you need to control more of your value chain in order to know where your food comes from, in order to have, you know, greater trust, um, engender greater loyalty from your consumer base who ultimately wants to kind of come in and add more, more kind of wholesome foods to their diet. And it's, it's, Funny, I was, that was, just a, looking, that was a lot. That was there was a lot there, but you know, this there, is this is you know the idea that people are taking greater agency over their health. Yeah, you can't argue that. The statistics are very clear. Yeah, and and I would only imagine that segment of the market to grow as that aging population, right? The boomers continue to uh, to enter that stage of stage of life. Um, now, before I let you go, I really need to just point the people at where they can find you. We know you're on the NASDAQ tomorrow, which I'm jealous of, right? I'm out here in the middle of the woods. I do miss New York from time to time. Uh, but when I think of New York, I'm not currently thinking of better for me food. I'm thinking of, you know, flatbread pizzas that you get out of a, a hole in the wall in the middle of the night. But, you know, I guess everything in moderation, I guess. But if people are interested a little bit more about uh, you guys, your company, your stock, um, you know, tell the people where to find you. 
Well, first of all, you can find us on the NASDAQ uh, under the symbol ABVE, ABVE. Um, secondarily, you can search us on X with the dollar sign ABVE. You can find us, uh, well, former Twitter. You can find us on LinkedIn under Above Food. You can find us on Facebook under Above Food. Um, and you can find us on all the channels, uh, above food or some derivative therein. But first and foremost, uh, you know, we are ringing the bell. Um, you know, watch us tomorrow uh, on the NASDAQ at Market Open, uh, ABVE. You know, if you're interested in the future of food, there's only really one company to be interested, and that's above. I love that. And I, I hope you're going to ring the bell on a positive day. You know, I know uh, every time I was step foot in the New York Stock Exchange. I'm like, oh, if the market crashes today, I'm going to, I'm going to think that I, I jinxed something, but, uh, <laughs> we're, we're looking pretty strong here. So, uh, hopefully you, can, you open it on a good day. We can only control the controllables, but we can control is our execution. And what we can control is, is having a positive impact on our communities. And that's what we'll continue to do. Awesome. I love it. So, you know, to the audience, check them out, check out the stock, check out the, the company. X, I guess. I'm, I'm going to have to train my brain to stop calling it Twitter. Um, so check them out there as well. And listen, thank you for coming by. Thanks for, for chatting with the audience. We'd love to have you back on sometime. Well, Michael, I really appreciate the time. And, and I thank your audience as well for tuning in and following our story. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thank you.